Coming up next, a security scare at San Diego International Airport as Terminal 2 is evacuated. An update tonight and the ripple effect on other flights. The border wall isn't finished, but are shipping containers the answer? Plus, a small plane crash lands on a street in the East County. A mother shares video of a local swimming instructor she says was too rough on her two-year-old son. What the instructor is telling us tonight. CBS 8 News Live at 6 starts now. We begin tonight with breaking news out of Central California. Good evening, I'm Marcella Lee. I'm Jesse Pagan, in for Carlo Cicchetto. Officials say at least two people are dead after two small planes crashed into each other while trying to land at the Watsonville Municipal Airport. This all happened just before 3 this afternoon. Watsonville is in Santa Cruz County, about 100 miles south of San Francisco. FAA officials say two people were on board a twin-engine Cessna 340. Only one person, the pilot, was on board the other plane, a single-engine Cessna 152. We are working to find out if anyone survived again. Officials confirming just moments ago that two people are dead. We do know that no one on the ground was hurt, so that's good news. We will bring you any new information here and on social media as we get it in. At San Diego International Airport tonight, Terminal 2 is back open after a security breach. Just a few hours ago, the entire terminal was shut down and flights were grounded. Passengers who were already on their planes had to get off, get screened again, and then reboard. If you're heading to the airport to catch a flight or pick up someone, check ahead. We were just on the airport site and it's causing quite a bit of delay. CBS 8's Shannon Handy has an update tonight from the airport. It may not look like it right now, but as of about two hours ago, it was pure chaos here in Terminal 2. The security line stretched from inside the airport all the way outside here down this corridor. Let's take a look at some video shot overhead by Chopper 8. You can see just how long that line was. This all started around 1230. A man went through security with a carry on. That bag was flagged for an additional check. Instead of waiting, he grabbed the bag and took off through Terminal 2. Now, TSA officers searched for the man but couldn't find him. That's when they decided to evacuate Terminal 2. They also halted flights and then after going outside, had everyone come back inside to get rescreened. That included people on planes. They literally had people who were already on planes get off and go through the screening process again. Here's what a couple passengers had to say about the situation. We just didn't even know what was going on. We were hoping we'd be able to get out because the plane was about half full when they uh, evacuated or asked us to deplane. And so it wasn't what I was expecting, but, um, you know, I guess you have to do what's safe for everyone. So they, they literally cleared the whole airport. My flight got canceled, and then there was a later flight. So I'm like, okay, let me take the later flight. And now I'm thinking, because I'm going to go visit some family, it's not an urgent trip for me. Like, I might just go home. Like, I don't want to deal with this. And in their latest update, TSA said that this breach impacted between five and 7,000 passengers. That's how many additional people they say had to be rescreened as part of this. Again, this led to delayed flights and cancellations. So if you do have a flight today and you plan to come down to the airport, you may want to check the status of those flights at this hour. However, security is back to normal planes are allowed to take off and land as for that man no word yet on if he was ever found or what was inside that bag so we of course will keep you updated on the very latest with that all right shannon thank you meantime a pilot is recovering tonight after surviving a plane crash under a busy highway in el cajon this morning the 65 year old man from san diego managed to land his small plane you see it right there right under the i-8 overpass near greenfield drive the aircraft went down shortly after 1030, caught on this camera there and hit an SUV. A neighbor's camera again captured the moment the plane came down. We see this plane coming in very, very low. So it captures our attention and we go, God, he's really, really low. And then we see him go to an angle and then we see him clip a car and then hit into the bridge. We talked with the woman driving the SUV. She says she was not hurt. The pilot was the only one on the plane. He suffered major injuries, but is expected to survive. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey says the state is using shipping containers to fill gaps in the border wall along the U.S.-Mexico border. But will that work? CBS 8's Kirsten Holmes traveled all the way to the unfinished border wall in Yuma, Arizona to see firsthand and give you a look. 
If you take a look behind me, you can see the shipping containers being installed right now because Arizona's governor says they just can't wait for the federal government anymore. We've seen Yuma's hospital system get overwhelmed with treating migrants and not being able to treat Yuma residents. Law enforcement has been overwhelmed with the massive amounts of drugs coming through and seizures and arresting people. Arizona's director of Homeland Security, Tim Romer, says since Friday, Arizona is spending six million of its 335 million dollars from the state budget to address border security issues by installing these shipping containers in the gaps of the unfinished border wall because Yuma just can't handle the migrants crossing the border every single day. The easiest thing to do today is to close the gaps. It will help everybody on the border save lives. But not everyone thinks using the shipping containers is the right thing to do. CBS 8 reached out to Arizona congressional representatives for comment, and District 3's Raul Grijalva says in part, quote, Governor Ducey is deploying his best political showbiz tactics. The use of shipping containers is reckless and expensive and is weak political symbolism at best. It's a lot more bipartisan than it is in other places in the country. Uh, we have Republicans and Democrats uh, right now. We have two U.S. senators that are Democrats that are constantly applauding the governor's efforts to secure the border, to use the National Guard. State Democratic leaders in Arizona say that's just not true. They disagree with Romer, saying the money for Arizona's border fence was approved in a separate bill outside of the bipartisan state budget and had no Democratic votes. And there are now questions about the shipping containers effectiveness after this picture showed up that two containers have already fallen over. This ladder is used to jump over the wall. Enrique Morones with Hente Unida, a human rights border coalition, says the shipping containers will not keep migrants out. The 30 foot wall is causing people to fall off the wall, break their neck and die serious injuries. These containers are actually easier to scale. They can use ladders like this. They have a flat surface and then they use a rope. Kirsten Holmes, CBS 8. An 18-year-old man is pleading guilty to murdering a hiker on a trail in Carlsbad. Haloa Bodet was 17 when detectives arrested him for killing 68-year-old Lisa Thorborg on the Hosgrove Trail in 2020. A hearing was scheduled for next week to determine if Bodet would face trial as an adult. He's expected to be sentenced to September 1st. Parole hearings were held today for two high-profile killers from San Diego. One of them, school shooter Brenda Spencer, will not be getting out of prison anytime soon. But as CBS 8's David Godfordson reports, the parole board did grant the release of Laura Troiani, a Marine wife who had her husband murdered in 1984. 60-year-old Brenda Spencer and 61-year-old Laura Troiani both had parole hearings on Thursday. Spencer, who in 1979, at the age of 16, opened fire on Cleveland Elementary School from her San Carlos home across the street, using a 22 rifle her father had given her for Christmas. She famously told a reporter she did it because I don't like Mondays. But when Spencer appeared for her hearing Thursday morning, she told the parole board she was agreeing to a three-year denial meaning she won't get another chance at parole until 2025. Deputy District Attorney John Cross attended the hearing and was prepared to oppose her release. It was obviously a horrific crime. There were two individuals who were shot and killed, the school principal as well as the school custodian, police officer who was also shot in the neck, he survived. And then there were eight children between the ages of seven and 10 who were shot. It was heinous and horrific crime. In the other case, parole was granted for Laura Troiani, a mother of two children who in 1984 convinced five other Marines to participate in the murder of her Marine husband, Carlo Troiani. Laura was having an affair with at least one of the other Marines. She lured her husband to a remote area in Oceanside, telling him she was having car trouble. He was ambushed, shot twice, run over with a car, and died at the scene. The motive? Life insurance money. Troiani has spent 38 years in prison. She told the parole board she was sorry for her actions, that she was the victim of domestic violence, and that thanks to therapy, she is a changed woman. Quote, I am working to be the best me I can possibly be. I love myself today, and I am able to see others that there is light in them. I am able to see that they are human and they too matter. This is something I didn't have 
prior to having Carlo killed. We believe she is still a danger, that she should not have been granted. She says that she's culpable, but then she turns around and minimizes what she did and deflects the blame. So that is quite troubling. Now, Troriani has recently been diagnosed with colon cancer, according to her attorney. The full parole board and the governor still need to pro approve her release, and that could take uh, five months. Wow, quite an update. Thanks, David. Now, did any of the victims' family members attend the parole board hearing? Uh, yeah, Troriani's daughter, who was just two and a half years old at the time of the murder, uh, spoke in favor of her mother's release. Relatives of the deceased husband spoke, uh, actually wrote letters in, and they were read into the record, and they opposed his release. But again, those board members, uh, uh, they said that they do not believe Laura Troriani is a danger to the public. They approved her parole, and so that's going to go forward. All right, we'll see if uh, the governor signs off on that. Thanks so much, David. The Padres are back in town after a rough week, facing questions about superstar Fernando Tatis Jr.'s suspension. Our Marcus Greaves was actually in the Padres locker room earlier today trying to get answers, talking to players. Marcus? Yeah, it was interesting one. The Friars are back at Petco Park, facing off against the MLB's worst team in the Washington Nationals, but this is also the first time back home since the suspension of their superstar Fernando Tatis Jr. Tatis was expected to talk with the organization and his teammates today. Later, it was reported that he wasn't actually going to be at the ballpark to address them. There was also speculation Tatis was meeting with general manager AJ Preller, but not at the ballpark. I did ask the Padres PR team if Tatis had met with Preller. They told me that they didn't know, but they figured they were scheduled to talk sometime soon. I did have a to go down to the locker room and talk with some of the players in regards to this entire situation. It was it was very tough. It was very tough, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there you know, by his side, you know, I'm talking to him every day, you know, he's, he's feeling very bad and, you know, everyone is, you know, talking bad, but that's how, that's how, the, that's how it's the world, you know, you, you make one mistake and, you know, everyone want to crucify you. I think obviously, um, you know, getting the news was uh, surprising, um, but, uh, you know, I think we've handled it fine, everything's, uh, you know, been somewhat normal um, during that, so I think uh, you know we just take a game at a time and go out there and play the game. Uh, we've uh, played without them all year, so uh, nothing really changes with that. Yeah, we've moved on. Um, you know, it's it's hard. You want to sit here and think about you know what happened and, and everything that comes with it, but you know we got to move on. We got baseball to play. We got you know a bigger thing in mind right now. So um, you know the initial first few days were difficult, but I think everyone's moved past it now and we're we're moving on without them. Yeah, it's a very odd situation right now, but after talking with the players, they just seem to want Tatis to communicate with the team. Then, of course, the situation can move forward, you guys. All right, Marcus, thank you for keeping tabs on that.